Hi, I'm Risha Desai, and today on Raise the Line, I'm happy to be joined by Dean Ho. Dean is the director of the N1 Institute for Health, the director of the Institute for Digital Medicine, and the head of the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the National University of Singapore. Dean and his team recently put together a paper that used artificial intelligence to figure out which of the many drugs that are out there can work in combination to get the best results for COVID-19. They've used this technology previously, and Dean is gonna be here talking about it with us today. Thanks so much for joining us, Dean. Dean, what do you think the COVID crisis has revealed about the global healthcare system? What do you think are some key steps that could strengthen its ability as we start thinking about the next big crisis? With regards to the current pandemic, I think that one of the key needs uh, for the global healthcare system and the global healthcare innovation community is that we need to move beyond traditional ways of how we deploy therapies uh, to address uh, emerging pathogens. Um, take, for example, the way we do it now, we often look at different mechanisms of action. How do certain drugs work? Can we combine these drugs uh, to leverage some sort of coordinated activity or a combination therapy uh, to go after what could be um, these aggressive pathogens that we don't understand very well? The challenge is it takes a very long time to really understand how to optimally design drug combinations with the way we do it now. And I think that leveraging different technologies like AI and digital medicine we can find optimal combinations and we can do it much more quickly than traditional approaches. We're talking about days to maybe just a couple weeks. And when that happens, in lieu of trying many different repurposed combinations, we'll arrive at an answer a lot faster. And when that happens, we can help patients in a more efficient manner. So walk us through this. I mean, uh, you know, I think at home, people are probably wondering, you know, uh, when you think about drug combinations, What's, what's the big challenge with just doing it manually and saying, does A work with B or does A work with C and then figuring it out kind of the, the old fashioned way? Why do you need artificial intelligence to help with that? Artificial intelligence uh, exists in many forms. And I think to design optimum combinations to address COVID-19 with AI, we have to think about the beginning. How do we do it now? What can we do better? The way drug combinations are designed now is by leveraging what we believe to be the way that that drug works and then combining different drugs and have them attack different mechanisms uh, by which viruses infect, divide, et cetera. The thing is, if you look at the traditional approach, we think, hey, maybe drug A plus drug B when combined uh, will have a better combination effect than just drug A alone. Uh, the challenge with that is uh, optimizing combination therapy is a lot more complex. We have to leverage these unexpected drug interactions that occur, which can boost certain drugs' activity, certainly make them function even more potently. The big challenge is let's, let's think about a broader collection of drugs. Let's think about 12 drugs, for example. Is it going to be drug 1, 8, and 9? That's the optimum combination. Drugs 2, 3, and 4? five, seven, and 11, and at which dose. Because what we've shown in the past is that to really optimize therapy, you need to get the right drugs together, but each drug has to be at the right dose. If we think more broadly about this, 12 is a small number, right? 12 drugs. But since we don't know how to optimize, if it's a traditional design approach, let's try each drug at 10 doses, for example, right? Let's do some sampling but then here's a problem. 12 drugs at 10 doses is a trillion possible combinations, right? There's just no way to use traditional approaches to try that many combinations. And so using AI, what's interesting in our case is our AI doesn't just use old data. We don't mine old data and try to make sense of it. We run actual experiments that can help us reconcile that entire one trillion combination space to then find out which combinations rank from best to worst because we're able to pull out these unexpected drug interactions. And so instead of a thousand years or something like that to, to try a trillion possible combinations, it takes us two weeks and we can get it done. 
So that makes a lot of sense. You know, the combinations I had never thought about that, uh, that number, obviously a trillion makes it very clear why AI is needed. I'm curious, is it possible that, you know, one combination, let's say one, eight, and nine might work for, for uh, Dean, but two, three, and four might work for Rishi? Is that, is that possible? And if so, how do we figure that out? It's really important to think about both putting the right drugs together and giving these drugs at the right dose when we think about how to both optimize combination therapy and also potentially personalize combination therapy. If we think about a patient number one, uh, myself, for example, getting drugs, you know, four, eight, nine, and Rishi getting drugs eight, nine, and 11, absolutely. Uh, different drugs will work better for different patients. Uh, it'll work better for patients, probably depending on their clinical severity. But the important thing is we know that different patients are, uh, their responses are different from each other. We know that. But it's important to note that our response within ourselves evolves over time. So Dean on a Monday and Dean on a Friday could be two totally different patients. So how do we address that? You know, we have a couple options. One is we can go and try to design a totally different drug combination uh, for Dean on a Monday and Dean on a Friday. But at the same time, uh, the dosing matters quite a bit. And the reason is how the drugs work with each other, that changes over time. And it's actually dose dependent and time dependent. And so if we come into a scenario, and this is probably a little bit more applicable for infections that are a little bit more longer term or sustained, that if we start changing the dosage over time, we can sustain optimized care for that patient. And we've done this clinically uh, for indications ranging from HIV all the way to solid and blood cancer. So we, we've prospectively validated this on patients. And you apply this to COVID-19. Do you mind walking through the paper that you guys uh, sent out and, and kind of some key findings from that? Sure. So recently, uh, we uh, validated the Identify platform uh, to a SARS uh, coronavirus 2 model um, derived from a patient live virus. Uh, we started with 12 drugs, and these drugs included remdesivir, favipiravir, ritonavir, lopinavir, and others. Um, and again, 12 drugs, small number, but it's a huge space of possible combinations. And when we do this, we systematically design different combinations. You know, drug 1, 8, and 9 at a certain combination in concentration, 2, 11, and uh, 12, for example, at a different concentration. And what we will do is we will give these different combinations to wells containing these viruses on a plate. And what happens is this is where we really do diverge quite a bit from traditional drug development and combination design. Under traditional approaches, we'll take a small number of drugs. We'll take drugs one and two, combine them because we think they might be useful, and we will give them to the virus. And then we'll kind of cross our fingers to see if uh, the combination works. In our case, we're trying this, these different combinations at different dosages, and we let the viruses tell us where the optimum is. It's almost akin to crowdsourcing the virus to say, hey, look, I'm going to give you this combination. It'll, and the viruses will come back and say, actually, that's those, not that effective. We'll try a different combination. They'll come back and say, oh, 40% of us have been blocked from infecting a particular healthy cell. And then eventually we kind of go through these iterations, but instead of a trillion possible iterations, we only need about a few hundred experiments um, from which identify is able to pinpoint exactly which combination was the best. And the cool thing is that since we're crowdsourcing the viruses, we don't know what the best combination will be until after the experiment's done. And what that does is that eliminates a lot of potential bias in where we think the best combination might be. The only real potential bias is which drugs we started with in the first place. But the beauty is, once the experiment's done, we'll get this ranked list of what the best combination is all the way to the worst. And it's really kind of working with the virus to tell us how to best treat it. 
One of the other uh, interesting features of your platform is looking at safety uh, and making sure that these combinations uh, are safe. Uh, can you talk about how you guys look at safety, given that it's not done in, in human beings, but it's done in vitro? Absolutely. I think that uh, looking at safety of these new combinations uh, is important. And so we ran these combinations against a human cardiomyocyte, uh, a human liver cell line, as well as a non-human primate kidney cell line. So we're looking at cardio safety. We're looking at liver safety. After we develop optimized combinations against the SARS coronavirus, which in this case turned out to be remdesivir, in combination with lopinavir and ritonavir, it's really important to evaluate uh, the potential toxicity or tolerability of this combination. And so given that this study was in vitro, uh, we ran a toxicity study on a human cardiomyocyte, a human liver cell line, as well as a non-human primate kidney cell line. And so what that does is allow us to look at kind of a broader spectrum of interaction of this combination with uh, these types of cells. And what we found was that when we combined these three drugs together, there was no apparent increase in toxicity beyond acceptable levels, right? If you look at these three drugs, remdesivir has been extensively trialed on its own. Lopinavir, ritonavir has been given to many, many patients primarily for HIV. So these, so, so lopinavir and ritonavir is a well-established therapy. And when we combine these together, we just don't see an increase in apparent toxicity, which is quite promising. And one thing I did want to mention is that What's neat about Identify is that we optimize inputs and outputs. What that means is when you use inputs like drugs and their dosages, we try to optimize the output, which is efficacy and safety. And so when we do this, we can set that efficacy and safety output to what we want in collaboration with the clinicians. For example, if uh, it's oncology, we can set the efficacy to... Uh, looking at reducing tumor burden and then safety to reducing liver toxicity. For uh, antiviral, it could be reducing viral load and also maintaining tolerability in the liver, right? And so we can set these different guidelines and objectives to make sure that we're optimizing for many things at the same time. So Dean, right now we're looking at which one medication seems to be the best for treating COVID-19 and identify the platform that you've developed with your team uh, does a great job of figuring out which combination works best. Do you mind just explaining how you go from figuring out a combination of drugs from knowing just one drug that might be effective? We call this, you know, multi-parametric optimization in this particular case where um, it, it, it could be patient specific, right? If a clinician comes to us and says, I have a patient um, that has uh, previous or pre-existing liver condition, um, can we look at a combination that does not contain a certain drug because they have a comorbidity? Um, and what's important to note is given the current global challenges confronting or uh, COVID-19, um, drug shortages are a real problem, right? And so after we run Identify, it's important that we note that Identify doesn't just validate one combination both for efficacy and safety. We have this ranked list that spans the whole spectrum of best combinations all the way to worst. Now with that, a clinician can come to us and say, I don't have remdesivir or I don't have this particular set of drugs. Can you find me the next best combination? Or like I just mentioned, the patient has a comorbidity. Um, we've already tried these drugs. Can you give me another option? Uh, we were allowed to query this entire list, which gives us sustained actionability against COVID-19 and other diseases and just gives us multiple options. Yeah, I mean, that, that's brilliant. And I can tell you as a clinician, that's exactly my next question is, you know, what do you do if you've already tried one drug, it didn't work, or let's say a patient isn't able to tolerate a certain type of medications? That makes a lot of sense. Is this something that someone could query on their own? Like, could they, for example, go onto a website type in like best combination for someone with lung cancer and then you could spit out, you know, hey, for this group, this is what we think or, or would they have to call you or how, how would that work? 
You read my mind. And so in a couple of weeks, we are going to release a resource that we call Identify Online. And what that is, it's a resource where um, a researcher, a clinician can go and look and say, look, here's these 12 drugs. Um, I'm interested in giving drug one at this dose, uh, drug two at this dose, and drug seven at this dose together. And they simply click the buttons, and then what will immediately show up uh, is the ranking of that combination from our entire list of combinations, the degree of viral uh, inhibition that that combination was allowed to mediate, and uh, the, the different toxicity readouts across those different cell lines we had talked about before. Now, um, this is mostly, uh, this is a research tool, um, and it's there to allow the community to understand just how big that parameter space is when we try different drugs together. And I wanted to note that we tried 12 drugs. And from that, we, we came out with these ranked lists. And these lists did tell us, you know, which drugs maybe we should continue to pay more attention to. And maybe some drugs that we can kind of uh, put on the back burner for a while. And so over time, we will run more identify experiments uh, added in. And so over time, we will update Identify online to include other possible combinations and drug candidates. So it's a evolving machine that we're going to put uh, out there as a resource for the community. Yeah. And I mean, j just uh, very recently, a paper came out about zinc plus hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. That combination seemed better than uh, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin alone. And uh, it occurs to me that this is going to keep happening over time as we're going to see new combinations and maybe uh, new, new levels and things like that. Or does vitamin D in the context of something, does that help? So I'd be curious to know uh, how you're updating it. So you just answer that. Uh, do you feel like there are certain lessons that people should take or, or maybe warnings in terms of how to interpret this data uh, and maybe some misinterpretations that could come out of it as well? Sure. I think that when we look at identify, um, it's important to note, first of all, that it's in vitro, right? We, we did this off a patient-derived live virus. Um, but one thing I will note is that if we equate this to traditional uh, drug combination design, we are finding the very best uh, combinations out of this massive parameter space as opposed to running a small number of experiments. Like we're not running 10 experiments and finding the best out of 10 we are finding the best out of hundreds of thousands to a trillion, right? And so I think the key thing about Identify is that it's allowing us to start off on the right foot, right? Because what we often find with Identify is that the top ranked combinations are unexpected, but at the same time, com combinations that were tried already before and derived using traditional methods, they always appear on this list as well of ranked combinations. And more often than not, a lot of the traditionally derived combinations are not ranked very highly. Now, that doesn't mean that they're completely ineffective. It's all about relative efficacy, right? But if we've started off correctly with the right combinations, it's important in terms of interpretation to know that whether we go to an in vivo model next or whether we go into a clinical trial next is that the dosing may have to change. Because as we've said before, it's about finding the right drugs at the right dose. Dosage alone can play a critical role in just how efficacious that combination is. And importantly, drug dosing can determine which drugs belong in that combination in the first place. And that is a totally overlooked aspect of drug development. But we're, we're, we're addressing that from the very beginning, getting the drugs and the dosages right, right? Once we move forward into clinical trials, for example, we'll really have to look to make sure we get the dosing right because good drugs, even good drugs given at the wrong dose, the perception is you'll get some efficacy out, just not as much as you can get. But the reality is you can even get no efficacy out just by getting the dosing wrong. And you can actually reacquire efficacy potentially by getting the dosing right. And we've seen evidence of that in human studies as well. So what I would say is, Identify you know, sets us off correctly with the right drugs to think about. And what we've also done clinically is shown that we can take combinations from the in vitro stage to the in vivo stage where we re-optimize the dosing again all the way through to human. And we've seen the same drugs preserved from in vitro to in vivo to human 
serving as the optimum combination. We've done that before with this technology. It's about starting off correctly. And that's why we're encouraged by Identify. And that's a pretty powerful piece because right now, as you know, in the US and really around the world, everyone's looking for the drug that's going to be kind of the, the magic bullet. Uh, what you're implying is that maybe it's a combination. And uh, your paper showed that there was a combination, the one you just mentioned, uh, remdesivir plus lopinavir and ritonavir, that seemed better than remdesivir alone. Is it being used? Is that combination being used clinically anywhere? And, and how is it uh, working out in patients, if you've heard of any cases where they've used that combo? In terms of remdesivir, lopinavir, and ritonavir being used in patients, we are in talks with a, you know, a wonderful clinical community, both here and internationally, about the potential of using this combination. I, I think that it's possible that it was studied uh, at least preclinically. Um, from what our understanding is, uh, at this stage, if it's uh, going to move into a clinical trial, uh, there's going to be some further steps needed and potential collaborations across industry as well as uh, academic medicine and other medical centers. So right now, uh, we're not aware yet of it being tried, but we are certainly uh, in discussions to see if we can make that happen. I think that if it does happen, um, or if, if it's happened before and we continue to look at it, we will, we will have to pay attention to how this combination is dosed, um, if there's some scheduling optimization needed, uh, because we're going to want to make sure if it's going into human that uh, we're pay atten paying attention to the toxicity. And also, the, the key thing with Identify is, again, that we can optimize dosing in the clinic. And if we can get that right, we, we may see some promise in being able to deploy this a little bit more. And one thing I wanted to mention is that it's important to think about uh, you know, inclusion and exclusion criteria if it does move to clinical trials because you know, we may be at a stage where we can look to see if there's uh, a specific subset of patients for who this uh, works better towards. And so um, that's what we're, we're, we're really looking at right now in terms of rolling this out into the clinic. Now, Dean, uh, one thing that people listening may not know is that you're based in Singapore. Uh, I'm based uh, in the U.S. We're leading the world in terms of cases and mortality. Singapore is on the other side of the spectrum, has been a shining example of, of what I think it looks like when it's been well managed. Can you just talk a little bit about what it's like being in Singapore in the middle of this uh, pandemic? Being in Singapore right now, um, it's a really interesting time and it's a very encouraging time, especially for the innovation community. Um, during these past several weeks, I've, I've witnessed these amazing efforts to build better diagnostics, uh, to build better therapeutics, to look at vaccines, and also look at this level of interaction between those developing new technologies, as well as the frontline clinicians, right, who are constantly thinking about, are there other things that we can try with the innovation community to further advance our capabilities of combating COVID-19? Now, if we think about Singapore as an ecosystem during this time, if we combine all of these innovators working on cool technologies, and you combine that with the, the amazing clinicians that are working so hard every day, there are other elements to think about, too, that can further strengthen this effort. Um, we have an amazing regulatory system here where it's about engagement. If we have questions about running a trial, about deploying a different technology in a clinical trial like AI, our regulatory system here is remarkably accessible. Um, we've had cases where uh, we can contact them on a Monday and we'll be on the phone with them on a Wednesday, sometimes even the next day, sometimes even the same day. And that level of actionability saves lives, right? And so that's been wonderful to see. The other element is looking at other communities within both the startup space as well as the academic space, uh, particularly I think about the, the business school. At NUS Business School, we've been working with renowned uh, healthcare economists to think about, hey, after Identify has been validated, how can we roll this out to benefit the public to be potentially a standing line of defense if something else shows up in the future and we don't know how to handle it, can we rapidly deploy, identify to find some you know, great combinations to try? And at the same time, what are the metrics we need to show for identify to be a sustainable platform? 
Do we need to get patients out of the ICU faster? Do we need to prevent patients from going into the ICU? What are the metrics we need to really roll this out? And so when we think about innovation, when we think about regulatory, we think about the economics of deploying these technologies all the way to the wonderful clinicians and what they do, um, this is just this wonderful ecosystem to, to catalyze how we can roll new technologies out. And so being in Singapore during this time has been truly encouraging. You know, there are a lot of young people listening in. I think listening to your story is very encouraging uh, as well. What would you say to someone that's maybe a young clinician or a young uh, scientist or young entrepreneur that's listening to your story and thinking, that sounds amazing. I wonder if I could ever get there, if I could ever kind of fall in those footsteps. Um, any advice that you could offer? When we think about the future leaders of medicine, entrepreneurship in healthcare and, and research scientists, um, I'm encouraged right now because I think that uh, what I would tell them is they are going to be the ones that will truly move us beyond traditional methodologies of developing new drugs, diagnostics, and uh, healthcare implementation. Um, when we think about everything that's needed, I just mentioned the need to have engagement with policy, economics, behavioral sciences, et cetera. I would tell them that the innovation of tomorrow is going to be based on uh, our ability to embrace uh, healthcare and practice changing medicine as a contact sport. Um, I never thought that I would be working with business school professors in areas outside of entrepreneurship, right? I, I didn't know that I'd be talking about potential pricing models for drugs and pricing models for AI. I didn't know that I would be working with global health security and surveillance uh, experts. You know, and, and one thing is, I, I really enjoyed working with you as well uh, on this project, right? You never know who you will get to interact with and work closely with to empower change in how things are done. When I started off our session here, I had talked about us needing to move beyond traditional drug repurposing and combination design, right? That is an effort that will require certainly research scientists, engineers, innovators, but at the end of the day, clinicians will have to be a critical part of this equation because they're gonna be the ones to implement a lot of these new therapies that are developed. And it's not about the developing the approach, identifying the combination, then passing it off. It's a partnership that has to start from the very beginning. And if we look at us, we had that conversation before we started this project and we were running the different drug candidates by you to make sure that after identify was done, that the combinations would actually be clinically actionable, right? We didn't, as I mentioned before, for identify, we don't know what the answers are until the experiments are done. We don't want to come into a scenario where we come up with this top rank combination and a clinician will say, I just cannot give that combination, right? And so we wanted to make sure that we had it right from the beginning. And so to all the future leaders in this space, it's about playing in a contact sport, engaging different disciplines early and working closely with everybody and just learning continuously. And when that happens, we will see practice changing advances in healthcare. Well, I, that, that's a good catchphrase to end on, learning continuously. I feel like you've definitely done that in your lifetime, Dean, and I've been admiring your career from afar. So thank you so much, Dean, for joining us today. I'm Rish Desai. Thanks for checking out today's show. Remember to do your part to flatten the curve and raise the line. We're all in this together.